Hello, everyone, and welcome to the March 2022 Legacies and Lunch, a program of the CALS Butler Center for Arkansas Studies. I'm Heather Register Zabinden, Outreach Coordinator for the Bobby L. Roberts Library of Arkansas History and Art. Roberts Library houses the galleries and bookstore at Library Square, the Butler Center for Arkansas Studies, and the Encyclopedia of Arkansas. The Roberts Library Research Room is open Tuesday through Friday from 10 until 5. And starting this month in March, we will be open every Saturday, noon till 4. So Tuesday through Friday, 10 until 5, Saturdays, noon until 4. We are also offering two programs this month for Women's History Month. On Monday the 14th, Kira Schmidt, We'll talk about the telephone operator strike in Fort Smith in 1917. And then on Monday the 28th, Guy Lancaster will talk with V.L. Cox about her art and the legacy of her artist ancestor, Louise Plinkington, among other things. I think they're going to have a lot to talk about. Um, both programs are at 6.30 p.m. and will be on Zoom. You can register for them at robertslibrary.org. So this program is being live streamed to YouTube and it will be available to view on the CALS YouTube channel immediately following. The speaker will answer questions at the end of the session. So please um, put your questions, type your questions in the chat box on Zoom. Now for today's program. This month, we have Sonia Tuji to talk about Arkansas women before the Louisiana Purchase. Sonia is an associate professor of history at the University of Central Arkansas. Her research specializes in the early encounters, Native Americans and African-American identity in the frontier, gender and intimacy, and slavery and captivity. She has contributed to the book, Arkansas Women, Their Lives and Times. So everyone, please give a warm virtual welcome to Sonia. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, Heather, for uh, the presentation, but also for the invitation. I'm, uh, I'm so happy to join you. Uh, this is the first time, and uh, we, we discussed that hopefully might not be the last time. Um, so uh, this presentation is very informal, but there is a, a little bit uh, uh, of academic as always uh, in uh, in our system. So it's gonna it's gonna be a little bit of there, but I'm um, I'm I'm trying more more or less present some different aspects um, of lives, of, of the lives of different women. The focus is mostly Native American women. Uh, in fact, after I reviewed my slides, I thought I maybe I should change that title. Um, but uh, it will also encompass a little bit uh, European women. Uh, again, all that uh, at Arkansas Post, and we're talking French times and uh, Spanish times, so all the way up to uh, 1803. Um, I'm having trouble moving my... Uh... Ah, here we go. Uh, so the, what we're going to be talking about is, is mostly uh, the encounters again at uh, the Arkansas Post, or what the French called uh, Aux Arkansas. And I'll start with the famous robe, uh, one of the famous robes of splendor, the three villages robe that I'm sure you uh, Arkansas history lovers here know about this. Um, and from scholars, from our understanding, this robe was painted by the Quapaws and was given as a gift to, to the French. And it represents uh, a famous battle that the Quapa and the French had fought against the Chickasaw Indians, their neighbors slash enemies um, in, in the early times. And we know there was one big uh, uh, Chickasaw attack at the, uh, on the Arkansas post that resulted in taking captives and usually captives, it's children 
and women. And so I want to start with uh, the story um, and odyssey uh, of this uh, woman. We, we don't have a picture. That's not a picture of her. And this is the, the other things with, uh, with records, especially when it's women's history. Um, so it's just an imaginary image there, really, of what uh, Mary Jean-Vierve Jean uh, Bourrier would, would be doing and would have looked like uh, during, during her time at Arkansas Post. Um, she was taken captive by the Chickasaws in, during this attack that I was mentioning that was pictured in that uh, painting, that famous painting. And we have a little bit, uh, uh, some records here and there that uh, tells us that after she spent some time at the Chickasaws, she was eventually sold uh, to the British, uh, some British colonists uh, on the East Coast. And we found records uh, of her living in, in Charleston, uh, 1751. Um, she, we eventually found her traces in New Orleans. She, by then she's a widow. Um, and uh, the issue is the record that I found about her, uh, about her life in New Orleans and her telling this story about what happened to her. Uh, there was no next page. So I'm, I'm opening, I'm looking for the next page and, and there is no, no next page up to now, you know, who knows, maybe in the future we'll be able to find more records, but um, as of now, that's that's it. That's all we know about the story uh, of marie Geneviève Boré, right? And so if records are allowing us to recover just a little bit um, of the stories of uh, European descent, uh, the question event is, what about her story? What about the Native American woman's story? And it's been difficult to recover uh, their stories, their untold stories, but we have mostly to rely on, on the records, European records, and it's usually men. So if we're getting into the gender studies or gender analysis, uh, we, we always have to be very uh, careful with how how we, we interpret uh, these uh, records. But at, at this point, it's, it's mostly what we have, right? So going back just a little bit as a, that historical context and, and geopolitics uh, during that time frame, uh, again, another famous uh, uh, map of the lands or the territories uh, of Arkansas and how it was mostly occupied uh, by the Quapa, their cousins, the Osage, the cattle towards the Texarkan, te towards Texas, Texarkana area. And then we see the Chickasaws and, and the Tunicas, uh, both uh, uh, nations have been at war with, uh, with the Quapas, but more specifically, uh, or uh, more, more predominantly, uh, the Chickasaws on the east uh, that occupied what's today Mississippi have uh, been, uh, have committed several attacks on, on Arkansas Post. And some of it had to do with captivity because the, the, the idea of captivity and women's slavery has evolved through colonial times. And so there was in, in the history of the Native Americans, captivity was just part of war, but then eventually it became a reason for, for an attack to get these uh, women captive and then sell them um, as slaves. So that's a little bit the geopolitical or uh, uh, it, time frame for, for the stories I'm, I'm telling here. Now, Going specifically into uh, the women and, and their role, and that's what the title was about, right? They did all the work except for, for hunting. And that's a quote that um, uh, we'll eventually get to. And that's doing that work was mostly uh, portrayed by, uh, by the European, um, uh, European men who, who narrated these stories. But we also know through the tradition of the Osage, of the Quapa, of the Caddo, that women have always been at the center uh, when it comes to farming, right? Um, so 
the idea of them being farmers uh, gives them this control, gives them this uh, high ranking in the society. They are, they are uh, the bread makers or the, if, if we will, right? So they, they are uh, the head really of the household in that, in that aspect, right? They are making the food, they are in control of the food, they are in control of the supply. And even when they have uh, uh, guests, especially European guests, and later on Anglo-American guests, um, you always hear these stories about how the women were hosts, right? Like everything is is coming from them. Um, but there's also some religious, uh, religious native religious uh, stories or creation stories, if we will, that helps us also understand the role of women, um, not just in in the for the food as supply, but also think, keep them thinking about how food uh, and, and the offering of the food to, to the spirits, to the gods, was playing a very, very important role. Um, so there were some songs like the Buffalo and Corn songs. Um, it's, it's a very long song. This is an Osage song and it's a very, very long one. And it's basically telling the women, reminding the women, the Osage women, her responsibility of feeding your children. Um, and so it's it's of the essence uh, of the uh, uh, the Osage culture and the native culture in general. And then the second song that I have in there, the, the rights of uh, the vigil and sending of courage. That's a second song where women's role um, is participating in this ceremony and singing this song. And the song is about uh, sending courage to their husbands going to war uh, against the enemy. Uh, so there's that aspect of food, uh, religion, uh, but also they are participating in the war in a, in a spiritual way, right? In a completely different way that we could imagine. And then the second image there, it's, it's a representation of the cattle creation stories. Um, and it's basically showing this, uh, um, the, how they came under, underneath the earth. I, I, I'm not sure if you can see at the bottom, like they are really creation stories. They are emerging from the earth. That's where their origin uh, uh, comes from. And again, it's always, uh, there's this um, representation of how uh, woman and eventually what we call mother, Mother corn, right? As part of that creation story, and how mother corn uh, is feeding everyone, how it's it's that representation um, of the beginning, but also of uh, the, the the essence and, and the uh, uh, of of the of the culture and the and the system uh, in itself. Uh, in fact, uh, the cattle's are matrilineal, not matriarchal, but matrilineal, meaning the lineage is traced through. Um, uh, the mothers, right? And so we have all these little stories. Some of them are coming from that native perspective. Some of these songs and some of these traditions, oral tradition, uh, telling us a little bit more about the place of women. But it's also coming a lot from uh, the Spaniards uh, and the French, uh, although this was supposed to be the first one. Let me just go through through them all, all at once. And again, we, you know, we, there's no need there to, uh, focus on one or the other, but really just a, a, a sampling here of what French men, uh, some of them um, uh, priests, who have encountered these uh, uh, Native American societies in the early stages here in, in Arkansas or in Louisiana, what used to be uh, uh, the Louisiana, before the Louisiana Purchase. And they're just telling a little bit, as you can see from this first, uh, quote there, it's mostly about the physical, right? So we're talking about complexion and beauty. Um, and then the second one is about that, the very hardworking. And the term hardworking, I've noticed, came back um, more often uh, than the maybe the physical complexion. Um, and, but it's, it's always this story of how uh, the women are again at the heart of that production of that food production food supply. Um, the hunting was was a man's job, but everything else from bringing the animal back to the to the camp and uh, the, especially the process of uh, the hides was very very important for them to 
sell the product, obviously, but uh, but also it, they became uh, they became important for the Frenchmen, uh, Frenchmen who wanted to be successful hunters and 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 trappers uh, had that need for to have a, a a wife, a Native American wife, to to process to do all the work that they are doing already within their culture. Um, on the second part of the slide, you can see that it's specifically uh, uh, the, about the Kwapa men being lazy and, and they depended on, on women for everything, uh, say is being Bill, right? A, a politician, a governor. Um, um, Jutel, another priest also was talking about how they cooked all these dishes. Uh, and again, that very last quote uh, is he's telling us a little bit more about how he sees all these fields once he gets to Arkansas Post, right, right outside the post that, that where women have uh, uh, been able to, uh, uh, again, produce more food and variety of, uh, of foods throughout the time. So that's mostly what um, I've been gathering um, from these European um, men's records on, on women. Um, a couple of pictures there showing the very first uh, uh, priest and the very first French delegation that came down to Arkansas Post, uh, and that's Father Marquette. Um, and, and the second, so the first picture shows his, his trip coming down with the Illinois Indians and coming down to Arkansas. The second, though, is showing this hospitality that the French have always been talking about and how hospitable the Quapas were. And in the background, you can see women, right? It's, it's usually men, but you can still see women in the background because again, they are part, they are doing uh, that uh, hospitality work uh, from things that they've produced, of course. And then the second part is their participation in, in what, um, um, historians have labeled as the market economy, frontier market economy. And that's basically the exchange again. And that's that, that picture showing um, uh, a French trapper uh, about to seal the deal with uh, this native tribe, native nation uh, to, to possibly uh, receive that, that, that woman as a wife. Um, and we don't have necessarily, again, records from these women's perspective, but uh, we have uh, hints here and there about how important these women were for that um, frontier market economy, not just selling their own products, the things that they've made, but also uh, working on the fur that made their husbands uh, rich or even uh, if they stayed in their nations, their nations. Uh, rich. Um, the other power, if we will, or the other role of women uh, in these early stages, and something I've done in my own work and other historians have talked about, is the role of these Native women um, in, in, in diplomacy as diplomats. And I've got a few pictures here, a few um, representations of a visit. This is a very famous visit um, in the early 1700s, 1721, I believe. Um, is one uh, a delegation of Native Americans from this region, so Missouri, Arkansas area. And um, it was six, uh, I believe six chiefs and one woman. Um, and so they call her uh, the princess and uh, the, the, the French named her the princess, the, the Indian princess, kind of a Pocahontas version here. Um, and that, that representation is showing the Native Americans in a building in Paris and the French uh, crowds gathering to, you know, very, very curious about these Native, these Native uh, Americans and just seeing them. And they were there visiting, um, sealing a diplomatic relationship with the French. Uh, they, they visited the king. And the second picture here is showing Notre Dame, the uh, famous um, uh, cathedral in Paris, where the princess, the Native American woman, we don't even know what her 
there are speculations about her Native American name, but but she's just been known as the Missouri Princess. Um, she was baptized in this particular cathedral um, and then was married off to a Frenchman. So she came back and that's a picture of her now coming back wearing the fancy dress, right? With the husband, accompanied with the husband wearing uh, something in blue and coming back to, to her people, right? So she goes savage, right? In between quotes here and comes back civilized and with lots of gifts from the king of France, including a watch, I believe, or something like that. So there's there's there are, there's definitely more uh, documentation about a woman like this who represented her people as a diplomat. And again, her marriage, just like the kings and the queens uh, in Europe uh, married each other to keep to seal these uh, 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 diplomatic and military alliances. That's a little bit her role here. Um, from diplomacy, um, I'll move to the I'll move back to uh, the, the basic role of women here, and and in from from the French perspective, and it's really about uh, giving birth to to settlers, right? So the the French, especially at the very beginning had a really hard time um, settling and populating the, the vast area that they claimed. And it was very, very important to keep what they claimed. Otherwise the English will, will come and take it. The Spanish could come and take it. And so there's this, this call at the very, in the early uh, 1700s, uh, 1720s, even a little bit earlier than that, of the need, we need women. So they, they were, um, asking for either or, for the French king to send more women or to allow uh, the French to uh, marry these native women, but uh, they needed to, to be uh, civilized, right? So the idea is to civilize these French girls uh, and, and, and make sure that they don't live in the sin. This is coming mostly from um, uh, the priests and uh, uh, but also the governance, right? And so this allowed, oops, uh, I might have to uh, get up, sorry, my uh, charger, uh, but it should be fine. Um, so this uh, allowed this, this idea of uh, uh, the need to populate the colony by, by sending, either sending women and marriageable girls to, to uh, New Orleans and then eventually to parts of Arkansas um, and then uh, allow them again to, to populate the, the, the colony. But we will see that many uh, of these French or these French girls who were sent from France uh, would not find suitors because the, the French men, as you can see here, uh, uh, prefer to marry the native women it's it's very difficult to um, really think that, that that's really that had to do with the physical appearance. My interpretation of this is that the Frenchmen, the fur trappers, uh, are needing these women uh, for that those skills that I mentioned about uh, earlier for the that herd all that hard work that they do, um, especially with the fur and how they they are able to. Uh, provide them their skills. Um, so slowly, slowly, uh, we see more mixing, uh, even though not necessarily in the records, uh, the ecclesiastical records, but we have some uh, hints here and there about how uh, slowly, slowly we see the mixing of these native women, whether they are Kwapa or from the region, captives who came in from, from uh, the area. Uh, with the French men. So and that's that title is 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 really about reminding us again about those historical records and how uh, it is hard to find most of these unions. A lot of them are very informal, uh, what you called uh, um, uh, uh, marriage in the Indian way, a la façon du pays, as they say in French. Um, but a couple of uh, written again records from the Europeans with Joutel, for example, who was among the Caddo Indians, 
uh, said he found this guy, his name is Barbier, who would who had a girlfriend, right? Who would just take uh, find a moment to uh, uh, to slip aside from from the group. And uh, yeah, you see the word made he, uh, made is used to portray the native woman. And that's another thing too with the records. Um, so he, he made sure he married the couple again to preserve uh, that Catholic uh, tradition. Uh, but I wanna mention how, again, the records are very, uh, very hard to read sometimes and interpret because you would see the words maid, concubine, wife, and more uh, to represent uh, these, these unions between these uh, French men and Native American women. And so it's just really hard to uh, picture, uh, to give a, a, a true picture to, to these unions and, and these uh, relationships. Um, Jean-Bernard Bossu, another, another French man, again, as you can see, all of these quotes are coming from men. We don't really have much from coming from women's side. Uh, Bossu is all again talking about how these Kwapa women are showing great affection to the French men and that they like them better than the Spanish. This is after I think his second visit. He, he visited Arkansas three times. Um, and, and I was in, in the records, there's I think at, up to now just one, the ecclesiastical, the church records. We only have that one uh, marriage of uh, Michael Bone and Marie Louise, a Kwapa Indian. Uh, who was obviously being baptized and given uh, the name Marie-Louise. Uh, so, so far in those sacramental records, that's really all we have. Uh, but we know that the Métis children um, and the complaints of Father Gibault when he came in later on to the post and he was just horrified by all these French men living in the scene with these Indian women and children running around and how he needed to baptize everybody. And he was complaining about how Indianized the French men were, right? So the idea initially was to civilize the Indian women and the opposite has uh, happened here, uh, according to, to Shippo. And then we have some records also with the Chateau brothers, uh, the, the founders basically of St. Louis, right? And, and there they had both um, uh, French and uh, Osage wives. Um, and they also had Métis children with their Osage wives who were actually working for them. They ended up in their uh, payroll. So they are their children, but they are uh, very uh, influential and very uh, uh, they took a, a very big role in the in the fur trade uh, during these early early stages in in St. Louis. Um, and a, a moment really that came to uh, uh, impact women's life in uh, Native American women's life in in what used to be the this territory of uh, Louisiana is a Spanish decree uh, that came in uh, in the late uh, uh, 1770s. And it was uh, a law that prohibited the enslavement of Native American women. Um, and after this law was passed, we have two things, we see two things happening. The French not using the term slaves or maid, uh, uh, or servant anymore. They say that, that, that that's my wife and because uh, otherwise they are supposed to let them to, to release them. Um, so we see this change into wives um, uh, versus the other words that were uh, used to, to uh, portray these women. And then the second thing that happened is we see uh, children, especially uh, mixed children of African and Native American descent uh, petitioning for freedom if they could prove that their mother was of the Native, Native American descent. And so these are a couple of things that uh, we see happening within uh, this um, uh, time frame. Moving from Native American to uh, just a little bit, I, I, I've got another five minutes here. Uh, to uh, class and women of Arkansas Post and a couple of stories here. Uh, these are, if you remember, this is uh, 
uh, Marie Genevieve uh, that we talked about the story, the woman who was captive, your typical low class uh, uh, woman at Arkansas Post versus this lady, uh, Marie Madeleine uh, de Lino de Chalmette, uh, who was the wife of uh, Louis, her, the, the uh, commandant of Arkansas Post during that uh, attack of the Chickasaws that we talked about where uh, Marie Genevieve was taken captive. So both will, women were at the Arkansas Post during that attack. And one, the bourgeois, if you will, uh, is uh, safe, uh, at home while the other one, uh, lower class, was carried away by the Chickasaws and, and sold uh, into captivity. Um, and so it's just, again, one, one tiny uh, aspect that we could uh, see through some of the records. Um, and uh, this is Victoire. Uh, Victoire is, is Marie Madeleine's granddaughter because uh, what what we see happening is uh, Jean, so Marie Madeleine's son, or or Louis, the the the, the commandant uh, at this time, will himself become commandant of the Arkansas Post between 1790 and 1794, and that's the time where his daughter Victoire um, was at the Arkansas Post as a child, and then one uh, his fa her father. Uh, finished uh, his job and, and, and his duty at Arkansas Post, uh, they moved uh, to New Orleans where we see uh, again her enjoying that bourgeois life that uh, was not a possibility at Arkansas Post. Um, and then two, two more uh, stories here uh, uh, of these two women. Um, Marie Felicité Valier, and again, the Valiers are known to be uh, uh, mixed with, with the Quapas a lot. Um, but uh, Marie Felicité uh, here uh, was the daughter of uh, Joseph Valier, another famous uh, commandant um, of, the, uh, uh, of, the, of the Arkansas Post. And there was no formal school at Arkansas Post uh, whatsoever. And so she had that privilege to attend uh, school in New Orleans, the, the famous Jerusalem uh, convent school. And again, something that uh, upper class bourgeois uh, would get versus uh, the, the rest of the children of the post. And then on the right side, uh, Louise uh, Favreau, again, another wife. And as you can see, they're all either daughters or wives of a man, right? And mostly a commandant. And that's the only reason really that we have some portraits of them uh, versus the lower class or the Native American uh, women. Um, and so Favreau was also uh, a wife of uh, um, Commandant Duclou, uh, in uh, the Arkansas Post. And we found that she's donated, uh, when they left uh, Arkansas Post, she's donated a lot of these luxury items to the, uh, to the, to the church, to the chapel, the, the, uh, um, like uh, Kindle uh, holders and, and a few items of value, again, that an upper class bourgeois uh, Arkansas woman at that time would have uh, versus, versus the rest. Um, so, uh, I'm giving you a source there because uh, that most of what I've said here about these women um, is covered in uh, Buzz Arnold's article, Colonial Arkansas Women, and uh, all these pictures are taken from his, uh, from, uh, from his uh, sources. And so I would like to thank him for that. And uh, I, it's also a suggestion really for you all to, uh, to, take, a, to take a peek at uh, his article. And um, really comes the end of the Louisiana, uh, uh, colonial Louisiana era, right? As uh, the um, French brings it back from the Spanish, takes it back from the Spanish in, in about 1800. And then uh, by 1803, we all know that the United States would buy uh, the, this chunk of uh, North America. And again, 1802, all the way to the end, and we're gonna see again, all we know is that these 
men are mostly having fun and the women are doing all the work. Um, and the very last um, uh, uh, slide here showing you, I got, I got a couple more, but this one is just showing you that uh, movement of the Louisiana back to the French and then uh, to the Americans uh, once Bonaparte, when Napoleon Bonaparte sells it. And 35, uh, just want to take one minute to talk about this woman who has passed uh, uh, a year ago uh, due to COVID, um, and that's Billy Rice. She's a Kwapa, Omaha, uh, Osage, Ponca woman uh, that I had the privilege and the honor to meet. Um, that's me in the middle, dressed up. Um, and she used to uh, dress up the uh, Native, um, the uh, beauty queens in uh, in uh, in Oklahoma in 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 Quapa, uh, town Oklahoma during the uh, the powwows and that's her husband Kikipu and I just had the privilege to to share moments in their lives and they've shared so much with me and I wanted uh, to the, this to be a, an honor uh, to Billy as well thank you so much for the conversation Thank you, Sonia. That was um, that was fabulous. So I always will, folks, put your questions in the chat and we'll get to those. But I always start out, I'm always fascinated with where people find their sources, what archives they're using um, to look for their material. So where where do you get your sources from? Yeah, it's, it's a very good question. And that's really the hardest part for, for a historian of 18th century. And then especially if you try to specialize in women, right? Um, so sources, some of it is coming from these um, uh, travelers or uh, priests. And, and again, not many Europeans at that time, even the European men were actually, you know, uh, writing things down, right? Uh, so these trappers, probably most of them did not even know how to write, right? Uh, so it's really coming from the upper uh, class. It's either uh, a military person, government, uh, or priests. Uh, and so it's especially when it comes into marriage and, and these living in the same situations, it's mostly coming from the priests who are horrified by that. Um, and then from the native um, sources, it's really just going back. It's mostly secondary sources that I've used written by Native Americans. And this is one of the things that Billy always complained. She's like, well, when someone writes, you know, this, the history of our people, you know, a lot of times they don't include this or that in the oral tradition, just because it's not proof, right? And so some of my, of my sources are these uh, transmitted tradition, uh, oral tradition songs and, 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 and things like that. Um, and then the very last one it would be the Iglis, uh, the, Iglis, the, the, yeah, the sacramental records. So that's really baptism records and potentially mm -hmm. when children are baptized and then they would say, you know, Jean-Michel from Rouen or, um, and Marguerite. Uh, sometimes they, they would say a last, there's no last name when it's not of a European descent. And so you just read between the lines that it must be a, a native woman. Yeah, that's, um, you said early on in your program where you were talking about, you know, like you start to see certain words here and certain words here to describe things. And, and you do, you start picking up those little, it's, you do read between the lines. You have to have those, you know, little moments where you're like, oh, wait, I remember that from over here. So yeah, yeah. Picking up um, and reading between the lines is so important as a historian. Um <laughs> yeah. So we have a question. Um, did men make the pemmican? Is am I pronouncing that right? It's the um, the food. P e m m i c a n. Mm -hmm. Did the men? Did the men make that too, or just the women? No, it it seemed from the record that it was all made by women. Everything everything was made by women. They did it all. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's what that's what we do, right? <laughs> that's what we do even today, right? <laughs> Man in the audience. My apologies, but it is yeah. our month after all. So it is our month, and we're women here. So, <laughs> um, well, we do have we do have a question from a guy. He says, um, 
how soon after the Louisiana Purchase did daily life start to change for Native people in Arkansas? Very good question. Uh, not immediately. Uh, Arkansas was an unorganized territory for a bit. So until um, 1819, when we start seeing an, organ, um, uh, an organized territory sending an, uh, a governor, uh, uh, territorial governor and putting together that government, then we start thinking about if we're gonna attract more uh, settlers, more white settlers, we have to uh, remove the natives. And so that's when you see, you, you, when you start seeing the first uh, movements, but also the first treaties. There was one in uh, 1824 and then another one in 1834, mm -hmm. where slowly, slowly the natives are being moved to uh, Oklahoma. And you mentioned the convent in um, New Orleans, the Ursuline convent, and it's still there. Is, it I is. Mean, there's not a school there anymore, right? No, I believe it's it's mostly. Uh, I'm I'm not sure about the activity, but it, it's it's also still uh, there's an aspect of it that's a museum that people could actually visit. Yeah, but yeah, it's it's still there, uh, not very far from the Cabildo from from the government. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we when we go to New Orleans and we stay on that end of the French Quarter, and so we yeah. I. I had no idea. And then you mentioned it again. And I was like, oh, I know exactly where that is. Yes. Um, here's another question. What percentage of Indian women were Catholic? Very small one here in Arkansas. And part of it is also for big chunks of times, like I'm talking 40 years, uh, where there's no priest in Arkansas. Um, so for them to be baptized, to be uh, uh, converted into Catholicism, it would have to be, uh, for even the couple to get married in, in that Catholic way, they it would even have to travel all the way down to New Orleans, which, which was a long route that many people just were not willing to, to, to take. So not very many. It's only when someone like Father Gibault comes in very late, like we're talking, uh, 17, early 1790s, I believe, 92, 91, is where he finds all these people who have been married or lived together, have children, but there's no document, they haven't been, you know, that, that's when he goes on and, and baptize whoever is uh, willing to, and uh, so the, part of it is because we, there are lots of chunks of times where there are no priests in, at Arkansas Post. Yeah. Well, great. That is all the questions that we have. Um, thank you again for doing this. Um, we'll definitely have you back again to talk about a, um, something, you know, another topic that you're, that you're working on. So yes, thank you so much for being here and doing this for us. Um, and next month, everybody, we have Angela Chandler, who is going to talk about the Little Rock and the, the geology of the Little Rock. So don't miss that. That's gonna be April 6th, 6th at noon. So thank you again, Sonia. Thank you, everybody. Have a good one.